put onto our YouTube channel. So that is recording. So today we are going to have a talk by Camille, who is from PRISM, the Finger Lakes um, chapter of it. So she's going to tell us all about the, the uh, hemlock woolly adelgid and how we can help protect okay. our hemlock trees, which I was just out hiking today in a hemlock forest, and I really wish that they will stick around. So I'm excited to hear this talk and take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I probably should have put this up sooner, um, but I am going to be going over how to uh, survey and report Hemlock Woolly Adelgid using the Survey123 app. Um, so if you have a minute to install it before we get started, that's great. Um, but if not, I'll give people another minute um, when I get to that part of the presentation. Um, but so my name is Camille Kachechi. I am uh, the Invasive Species Project Coordinator at the Finger Lakes Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. Uh, we're one of eight regional prisms around New York State. And a prism is just a partnership between the DEC and some other environmental organization. Uh, in our case, that's the Finger Lakes Institute at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. So already a lot of environment with like the or involvement with like the environment and um, the lake specifically. Um, and so we do a lot of work with both aquatic and terrestrial invasive species, um, all kinds of stuff uh, like education and outreach, volunteer programs, um, research. Uh, actual like field work and removal and management and planning. So anything invasive species related um, is like within our radar. Um, and so I'm just gonna be going over before talking specifically about HWA, some of the most important like general concepts of invasive species. Um, I'm sure people have heard of them, but might not always have a fantastic grasp on what exactly makes something an invasive species, like what counts and why are they bad? So just to get our like core definition down, the two most important things that make something an invasive species are that they are non-native and they cause harm to the environment, economy, or human health. Um, and this can be really difficult to predict. You can't always look at something in its native environment and think, you know, I bet that if that comes over here, it's gonna cause a bunch of problems for us. Um, but there are things that they have in common with each other a lot of the time. So a lot of the time when something becomes successfully invasive in a different uh, environment, oh, well it has a high re reproductive rate um, so, you know, it's able to multiply very quickly. It acts very aggressively. Um, so in the case of a plant, this might mean like spreading and covering every other plant and like smothering all the others, not letting them get any light. Or in the case of animals, I like to give the example of uh, Eastern gray squirrels, which, you know, are native to us. Um, and we already, a lot of people find them pretty aggressive here, but over in the UK and Ireland where they're very, very invasive, um, they absolutely terrorize their native squirrel species. So they're they're very intense, very aggressive, great example of an invasive species. Um, something that has no natural predators when invasive species, you know, come over here um, when they're from like a similar environment or like similar weather, uh, seasonal patterns, and there's nothing eating them. They're like, hey, this is just like home, but there's nothing, you know, trying to attack me. So they're able to do these first two like uh, multiplying rapidly and acting very aggressive because nothing is kind of controlling those numbers. Um, and then especially like the biggest thing probably is that invasive species are really good at taking advantage of human disturbance. So a lot of the time you'll see like along highways um, in like suburban sprawl or uh, urban areas, like deforested areas, um, the edges of parking lots, anywhere that humans have uh, like had a really big impact invasive species love to populate. So um, if people have like driven by pretty much anywhere on I-90, um, those really tall reeds that you see with like the fluffy tops, those are invasive, that's Phragmites, if you didn't know. Um, another great example. So somewhere that people have touched, invasive species are likely to follow. Um, but how does this happen? You know, how does something become invasive? Where does it even get the chance to become invasive? And it can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, invasive species can and have many times been introduced both intentionally and unintentionally. Um, so intentionally, it might be that somebody releases a pet, you know, like a parent, uh, their kid has a goldfish and they, they're like, eh, we don't want to take care of this anymore. I'll just dump it in this lake or this uh, canal or whatever. Um, through horticulture, people intentionally introducing plants that survive really well and do great in their gardens and look beautiful, but then are able to rapidly multiply and spread all over the place. Or maybe we've introduced uh, another species of biocontrol to control something that is um, causing problems for us, maybe another invasive species or just a native pest. 
um, and that ends up becoming a bigger problem than what we uh, intentionally introduced it to control. Um, and then on the unintentional side of things, you know, trade, um, things get carried by accident, hitchhikers, uh, it's, you can't always, you know, check every single, um, like nook and cranny of a shipping container or your car, something like that. So there, a lot of the time invasive species are great at like grabbing onto stuff, not letting go and then ending up somewhere new or escapees, Burmese pythons down in Florida are a great example of this. Um, they were being bred in a pet mill, um, that was destroyed during Hurricane Andrew, and they escaped uh, unintentionally, and now they are a really, really big problem and have been invasive for quite a while now. So lots of ways that they can get into the environment and start causing trouble, but it's important to remember that invasive species are not the majority. Um, we follow something that we call like the TENS rule, uh, and so basically this is just only uh, roughly 10% of non-native introductions are able to actually like survive in the new environment that they get into and only a subsequent 10 percent of those survivors end up becoming invasive so it's really not that many out of all of the things that are constantly like getting into our environment through these many different pathways but that small number can have an absolutely gigantic impact and you know on top of all of these other things that uh like can allow invasive species to take hold. Um, we have climate change currently working against us, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of the invasive species that we get over here, you know, do very well in temperate conditions because they're from like similar climates and they are very tolerant to uh, a wider range of conditions than our native species are. Uh, so climate change is kind of giving them the upper hand because it's, you know, making our winters warmer, making our growing season longer. Um, and just kind of making things more comfortable for invasive species while putting additional stress on native species that are not prepared for these kinds of changes and have not adapted and cannot ad like adapt in the future fast enough to changing environmental con conditions that they did not evolve for. Um, and our definition of invasive species is even becoming more complicated because um, sometimes things are now being able to spread and act invasive when they are where they're supposed to be, or they they were. So Southern pine beetle, if anyone knows uh, about that, native to the southeastern US, supposed to be there, but it's one of their absolute worst forest pests. It is very, very expensive to mitigate. Um, and it is moving northwards and has been spreading into states um, more recently that it has not been in before without the help of people, just because winters are getting warmer, conditions are getting more temperate. And so it, it can, those natural barriers are not there anymore. Um, and so that adds to our kind of problem of, oh, we have to worry about all of these things coming from like outside of North America, but now even things inside North America are starting to act invasive. What do we do? What counts? So, you know, lots of different ways that they can become a problem, but to quantify the problem, those costs that I mentioned before, environmental, economic, and human health, um, just some of the things that we can lose within those categories in terms of environmental damages. Uh, invasive species are the second largest threat to biodiversity behind habitat loss. Um, invasive species have contributed to a lot of extinctions. Um, they can cause like structural changes within the environment that um, interferes with like natural processes uh, and then ecosystem functions and services. So like actually physically changing the landscape, changing where native species are able to inhabit um, and how they are able to like complete the jobs that they are supposed to do for us and for each other. Um, in terms of economic damage, uh, invasive species are really like difficult pests for agriculture. Spotted lanternfly is a great example of this. When they made their way into Pennsylvania in 2014, they absolutely decimated um, their grapes down there. And now they have been spreading into uh, the adjacent states and are a huge threat to our like agriculture, especially our like wines and um, like ciders in the Finger Lakes region. But they can also interfere with um, recreation, um, like infrastructure, physically damaging um, things that we put our money into um trade and management and then um like general costs of oh did zoom crash no it didn't we're okay sorry um uh interfere like having to account for management of invasive species and account for um like how do we prevent trade from spreading it is expensive in itself and then human health costs 
um, as our soil and our water and our air quality decrease, like so does our general quality of life, but also invasive species can cause um, like physical injury and disease. So uh, if anyone has ever encountered giant hogweed, absolutely miserable to run into, you definitely don't want to touch it. Um, and like, not only is that, you know, costly for your health, but also costly in terms of like medical bills and the stress it puts on our medical system. Um, and so all of these things added together globally, uh, a conservative estimate from the United Nations um, is that we are spending roughly $400 billion on invasive species control globally every year. Um, but that number has quadrupled every decade since the 1970s. So this is an exponentially growing problem. Um, it is getting like bigger every year and it's more and more of a concern every day. Um, and just this, this like, this figure I have over here is kind of how we visualize these exponentially growing costs. So in a perfect world, you know, we would love to just be able to prevent invasive species from ever being a problem. Um, but unfortunately that is not possible, even though it would save us a lot of money and damage and time. Um, because there are just so many ways that they can slip under the radar um, or like, as I mentioned before, intentionally be introduced and have unforeseen consequences. So we try to do a lot of work in the like eradication and containment stages where, you know, as the area infested is directly related to the cost, we want to work when there's as little of it as possible and try to remove it if we can, or at the very least stop it from getting any further. But unfortunately, a lot of the time, um, the public doesn't generally become aware of invasive species until they're well into the containment stage. And so uh, we have ended up with a lot of species being in this, like they're covering a lot of area. We're spending a lot of money on, um, on managing them because they have been here for so long and we just have to figure out how to live with them. Um, and you know, sometimes it's doable. Sometimes it is a lot less doable um, because these costs can't always be made up. And the Eastern Hemlock is a good example of this. Um, so, are there any questions about like general invasive species concepts before I move on to HWA and Eastern hemlocks and why they're so bad? Okay, great. So this is HWA. This is what it's going to look like to the naked eye. Um, it is a really, really tiny bug that is native to Eastern Asia. It's definitely native to Japan might be native to China, we're not entirely sure. Um, but it was first observed in the eastern US in 1951 in Virginia. It had been in the US on the west coast in uh, 1920 and it was introduced through um, like the import of Japanese hemlocks. Because uh, in its native range, uh, HWA feeds on like multiple different conifers. Um, so their hemlocks like over there, but also like spruce trees. And it doesn't cause like large scale environmental damage because um, like it is it is managed by other species over there. Um, but here it only feeds on eastern hemlocks, um, which are one of our keystone species. They're super important to our ecosystems and it uh, does not feed on anything else and there's nothing else controlling it. So this is the kind of damage that it can cause where it can just absolutely decimate a hemlock stand. And when I say that they're tiny, I mean like they are really, really small, like the size of a poppy seed or smaller. Um, so if you see them during the time of year that they don't have those like fluffy white cases around them, it's going to be really difficult to find them. Uh, and because they're so small, you know, they are able to spread on the wind, which means unfortunately we can't stop them from spreading. And that is an even bigger concern because um, HWA actually does not need um, like males to reproduce. The females can uh, reproduce entirely on their own through a process called parthenogenesis, uh, where they just lay a bunch of genetically identical unfertilized eggs. So they just clone themselves a bunch of times. And so even one of these just teeny tiny individual adult uh, female HWA getting into a hemlock stand, if left like unnoticed and untreated, can bring down that entire forest over time on its own. Um, but so when we look for them, we look for these like fluffy white uh, houses that they build for themselves as they feed on the sap of the hemlock, because once they like kind of pick a spot to start feeding, which is uh, they, they like the young growth, the like little twigs at the end of the branches. 
once they pick a spot, um, they start feeding and then they don't move. They build this little shelter around themselves called an ovisac to protect themselves and their eggs from the elements. Um, and then they stay there. Um, and so it makes them nice and easy to find them when it is the right time of year. Uh, and it is super important that we do find them um, because they have been spreading throughout the Eastern U US for, for quite some time now. Um, so as I said before, they were initially found in uh, Henrico County, Virginia, down in, um, back in 1951. Uh, and since then, you know, they've kind of spread, a lot of our invasive species, truthfully, in New York State will start like on Long Island. Um, but so they spread first down closer to Long Island and um, like New York City. Um, and then um, most recently have been found in our region, like farther north and they're proceeding up northward towards Maine and um, south towards uh, Georgia. So like over time, they're not spreading necessarily the fastest that we've seen. And, like other invasive species spread, but they definitely are on the move. Um, and a lot of our counties have had them like in the Finger Lakes region uh, for like six to 15 years. So they've been there for a while and they have caused considerable damage um, like in that time. Um, but why is this such a problem in terms of Eastern hemlocks? Why are Eastern hemlocks so important? Why, what makes HWA such an issue? So when you have a situation like the emerald ash borer, um, where it like, you know, decimated all of our ash trees, pretty much everybody has had an ash tree die from emerald ash borer. It's unfortunate. Um, it's definitely a huge loss to have a species be taken down like that. But we have other hardwoods that can like fulfill the same purpose as um, as ash trees. They are not completely unique and like the ecological niche that they fill uh, can be filled by other species, but with the with eastern hemlocks, that is not the case. They provide a completely unique role as a keystone species in our region. That um, if we were to lose them, it would like irreversibly change our landscape, um, because a lot of invasive or a lot of other species rely on the eastern hemlock for like their survival and their well being. So some examples of this are like the brook trout, which is our state fish. Um, they need really, really cold water temperatures in order to be able to survive and like carry out their um, like life cycle. And um, eastern hemlocks cast the most dense shade out of any conifer. Um, so, you know, in fall when all of the other trees are missing their leaves and then like early spring when deciduous trees like still haven't um, like put their leaves back out yet, eastern hemlocks are there to consistently provide that um, really, really dense shade for streams uh, and rivers to cool the water to the temperature that brook trout need. They say they provide the same like temperature and moisture control for our soil as well. Um, so if you didn't know, North America has uh, the most diverse um, like salamander uh, community in the, the world. We have the most species in one place out of like anywhere on the planet. Um, and so like this very like our our salamander biodiversity relies very heavily on eastern hemlocks because of that like soil uh, like temperature and moisture control that they provide. Hemlocks also have um, like very kind of spread out um, like windy roots that provide a lot of erosion control. Um, Hemlock Lake, which is the uh, water source for the city of Rochester, is surrounded by hemlocks, hence the name. Um, and because they provide such intense like runoff and erosion control, they really contribute to the water quality of that lake being so good. If we were to lose them all to HWA, we would be getting a lot more sediment flowing into the water. Um, and, you know, no one wants to drink that, but also the cost of treating that would be astronomical. Um, and there are some species that also rely entirely on eastern hemlocks to survive. So this species of mushroom, it's a Ganoderma mushroom called the hemlock rishi will only grow on dead Eastern hemlock wood. Um, and like, this isn't just important for its relationship with like other wildlife, but also like hemlock rishi is being actively researched for like medicinal benefits for people. So we're not just losing out on um, like benefits for things that aren't us, but also like medical applications that could potentially be used to treat sickness in humans. So, you know, it's very overwhelming. It's an unfortunate problem, 
a lot of the time when I tell people there's nothing we can do to stop it from spreading, they kind of get like, well, then what's the point? But there are things that we can do to treat it and work against it to prevent it from taking our hemlocks away. Uh, so for smaller scale uh, populations or infestations, particularly like on your own property, um, pesticides are very effective. Uh, so this is for um, like something that is people people ask like how big it's hard to say in terms of actual like spatial measurement um because like pesticide application can get expensive but when it's done correctly um it is it is manageable and so this isn't going to be like crop dusting or anything like that or just spraying um haphazardly it's going to be very controlled either basal bark uh sprays or like trunk injections and usually it'll be um the most successful like, treatment that we have seen is a combination of imidacloprid and dinotefrin um, because imidacloprid is like works very well right away um, but it doesn't last quite as long and dinotefrin works well not as well right from the start but it lasts longer so combining the two does work very well against um, HWA uh, it's just it does have to be consistently re reapplied in order to be successful and once you get to a large enough scale it's not really practical or affordable anymore um, but if you have hemlocks on your property and you find HWA or you just want to proactively treat for HWA in case, definitely consult with a licensed pe pesticide applicator because if HWA is left untreated, the tree will eventually die, unfortunately. <laughs> so it is a matter of like whether you want to keep your hemlocks or not. Um, but for larger scale in uh, infestations, biocontrols have shown success. Um, so this is something that would be on like a forest scale where we can't go through and inject pesticides into every tree just because it wouldn't be practical or affordable. Uh, there is a commercially available species that was tested as a biocontrol, um, which is like this beetle right here. Unfortunately, it doesn't really do anything and it doesn't uh, survive very well. But we do have some uh, effective biocontrols that are currently like under evaluation and, and have been um, like in research for a couple decades now. But Cornell is like the ultimate authority on HWA biocontrol. So um, this is a species of black beetle, Laracobius, and then um, two species of silverflies. And so they have a program where um, like areas first have to be designated as an official release site before those species can be um, like released to see if they can help control HWA in that area. But these species, unlike this commercially available one, have been found to be very effective and they have been effective in other states. So hopefully in the future, they will be more easily available to property owners. But as of right now, um, it is a, there, there is some red tape in the way. Um, but what everybody can do and what it is really important that we get people involved in doing is surveying. So like I said before, unfortunately we can't prevent the spread because they do get carried by the wind. Um, but if we delineate where they are now and we figure out where they're going to spread to next or where they haven't reached and we can like protect proactively, it tells us like, this is where we have to be treating. This is where we need to be applying these treatments. And this is where uh, we can be prepared to see them show up next, so it doesn't just like catch up, catch us totally off guard. And their life cycle is kind of counterintuitive because, um, unlike a lot of other, well, pretty much all other insects that we have in the area, uh, they're actually the most active and um, like easily distinguishable in winter, because um, this like. Oh, they have two generations per year and this overwintering generation, which is what we would be out looking for right now. Um, in like the late summer, early fall, when trees uh, bring all of their sap back down to the roots to prepare for winter, the um, nymphs at that stage will like go into estivation just to hibernate while there is no sap available for them to feed on. And then around the time that we start tapping for maple syrup, you know, end of December, early January, um, when the hemlock puts all of its sap back out into the branches, uh, that is when they will wake back up and they'll start feeding and they'll start building those like white puff balls around them. 
And the overwintering generation is the only generation that does this uh, because there is sap available through the entirety of spring. Um, so that other generation that this generation will be laying right now um, can pro progress through their life cycle much faster. So it's really important that we have people out there looking for HWA now when it is available. And those uh, white puffballs that it makes for itself make it pretty easy to distinguish. There's nothing that looks like it. Um, so it's not particularly difficult to look for either. Um, but if you're going to be looking for HWA, uh, you're going to have to know what a hemlock looks like. I'm personally really not good with tree ID, um, but hemlocks are very easy to identify. Um, so like even I can pick them out. So the first distinguishing feature is the needles. Um, and so like unlike most other conifers, they've got just like short flat needles. You can't really roll them between your fingers because they're just like a little flat. And the, the branches also grow um, like the, the needles only grow out of like the sides. They don't grow all the way around. Um, so I, I always like to say it's a very flat tree, <laughs> but, um, and it also on the undersides of those needles, when you find them has these like two white lines that kind of distinguish it from other conifers. So just to compare, um, hemlocks with these, you know, greenish kind of greenish yellow flat, um, short needles can't roll them between your fingers versus pine needles much longer um and like are are round and then spruce needles which are shorter um still but kind of more of this like bluish color and they go all the way around the twig rather than just coming out either side then the bark um just from the outside if the needles aren't enough looking at the bark it, it's this like dark brown it doesn't really have any deep ridges or furrows. Um, but a very nice, easy identifying feature is that if you break off a piece of the bark, um, it has this like reddish purple, like bright coloration. This piece was a little bit old when I took this picture, so it was kind of faded. But when you pull it off um, like and look at it in your hand right after you pull it off, it is very bright. We don't have any other native tree species that look like that. So if the needles aren't enough to go off of, just rip off a piece of the bark and it'll give itself away. Um, and then the cones won't really be very helpful this time of year, but some of them might still be on um, the tree or like laying around on the ground if those other features aren't enough to identify. Um, and they're really, really small. They're the smallest cone um, like of any conifer. They're about the size of a dime. Um, so if you do see them around a tree and you're still not like totally sure if this is a hemlock, if you see these teeny tiny cute little cones, um, then that's your last kind of identifying factor. And so uh, HWA, the way that it actually like shows up on hemlock is it will be on the underside of the branches. Um, so you see like those two white lines on the bottom. At the like very end of the branch, they start on the lower branches and work their way up the tree as the infest infestation gets worse. Um, and they will be at the base of the needle. So they won't really be on the needles or um, like the middle of the, the twig either. Um, so the base of the needles on the underside of the branch uh, is where you're gonna wanna look for them. And they really just look like a ball of lint. Um, very easy to identify. There's not anything else that really looks like it. So are there any questions about hemlocks, HWA, anything I've covered so far? I, I have a question. Um, when you're talking about pulling the bark off, is that dangerous to the tree? Like, could, could you kill the tree by doing that? Um, not unless you're like peeling off, peeling it off like really <laughs> deep or like very big sheets of it. If you just pull off like one little chunk, like the size of this one that I had in my hand, I didn't have to pull very like deep into the bark to get that. It's it's not super hidden, so no, it should be fine. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Great. Um, so the way that we have people survey for our volunteer program is using the Survey123 app. So if you don't already have it installed, if you could install it, 
Um, I'm going to go through how to make observations of HWA, like out either in your yard or along hiking trails, parks, wherever, um, because it's super easy. We have a very simple, straightforward form. Um, and it, it really helps us out to have volunteers collect data so that we know where HWA, where HWA is and kind of where treatment needs to be targeted and who we need to tell about it. So I'll give everyone a minute to install this if you have not done so already. And if people just want to say, like, I'm good <laughs> when, when you're done. <laughs> For people that aren't tech savvy that cannot install it. Is it the one that says A-R-C-G-I-S? Yep. OK. And when you open the app, um, the continue without signing in button is so small <laughs> and it tends to throw people off because they don't notice it at first. I wish that they would design it differently, but um, like saying it right up front, you do not need to make an ArcGIS online account to use the app. Um, I don't even think that you can without paying money. <laughs> so don't, don't make an account, just hit continue without signing in. Um, just putting putting that out there like right from the start because they for some reason made it very small and easy to miss. I have a question while people are downloading that. Sure. Um, do you recommend using this plus using uh, like IMAP or iInvasives as well? Like just having more out there for, for survey? So we're actually going to submit the data collected in this survey to IMAP Invasive. Oh, I see. Working, okay. So it's, yeah, we're okay. working with the um, New York Natural Heritage Program. Gotcha. Uh, it just doesn't get uploaded right away from mm -hmm. our form, whereas it it might end up online sooner uh, if you just sent it directly through them. But we have additional um, like criteria mm -hmm. that we ask people to fill out that really is not easy to do with IMAP. We have used the app for the program in the past and it has been very unpopular. <laughs> gotcha, okay. <laughs> um, if people are good, I'm gonna go over how to actually like get the app working. So like I said, hit uh, continue without signing in. And then, um, in inside the app on your like home screen once you get past that like startup screen there's this search bar at the top um and at the end of the search bar you're going to want to use the qr code scanner that is built into the app don't just use like your camera um because a lot of the time it will not work but so hit that button and then scan this qr code um and that should i think the first time you scan it it just like automatically opens the um the form but when you go back into the app to like reopen it it'll look like this on your home screen and you just have to click on it and hit collect so i'll give people a minute to do that again let me know if you have any questions mine's taking real long time to load this app so if i can't get it loaded before you go to the next screen. How do I get that QR code? Um, I can go back, um, and I can also. Um, I mean, what what would be a good way? I can post a link to the picture in the chat. If that would be useful. Okay. Just have to. Yeah, I'm at like seventy-seven percent. So. I sent the QR code in the chat in case anyone needs it once we move on. Perfect, that'll work. Great. Um, if that's all good, I'll keep going. So um, this screen will show up like when you reopen the survey, um, but to collect an observation, you know, hit the collect button. Uh, really important, you do not need internet to take surveys. 
So, you know, if you're out in the middle of the woods and you have no service or just you're on, you have like limited data and you want to wait till you have Wi-Fi, that's totally fine. Um, you can save the survey to your outbox to submit later. Um, so just take them anywhere and everywhere and then just submit them whenever you want. Um, and then you can also go back and see what you've submitted already uh, under the sent category. Um, but so this is what the form looks like. There's also an additional comment section that didn't make it into this picture. Um, but so it's very straightforward. Uh, all that we ask for is that you add your name so we know who's submitting the survey. Um, if you have IMAP and you know your IMAP user ID um, and you want to share it with us, that is useful because then we can give that to the folks over at IMAP who are going to put it onto the statewide database. If not, though, that's totally fine. Um, not required. And then Survey123 will automatically collect the date and um, your GPS location. And then we just need you to tell us like when you're observing uh, whether or not you saw HWA, uh, take a nice clear picture of it like up close of the needles that you're looking at. Um, and then tell us the like average tree size and canopy cover. So this is just so that we can gauge like the age of the stand and the general health of the stand. Um, so you're going to make all of your observations in here and they're aggregate surveys. So you don't have to go and do it for every single tree that you find, but just, you know, kind of stopping along the way for groups of around like 50 hemlocks, or if you just have one hemlock on your property, surveying just that one hemlock is fine. Um, so you don't have to do it for every single tree. And um, it's a little late in the program now, but what we like to ask people to do is at least two survey sites before April 1st, um, just so that you know we can get as much data as possible. But if you wanna do more than that, go right ahead. We will accept anything uh, and everything that you send us. Um, and even if you don't find HWA, still report it to us because, you know, knowing, hey, I surveyed here and I didn't find anything is still just as useful as I surveyed here and I found HWA. So non-detections are just as important to us as detections. Um, and just a really quick note about survey location. Uh, it should automatically collect your position, but um, because we're going to be submitting it to people at the New York Natural Heritage Program, we do like to uh, know how accurate the GPS coordinates we're sending them are. So it will give you, if your position is less accurate than 10 meters, it'll give you this little notification, like yellow thing. Um, don't be alarmed by it. Just try to hit that uh, little crosshair button to get maybe more accurate data. But if you can't, if it continues to give you this error, that's fine. We don't want anyone to feel limited by their device capabilities. So um, still make your survey even or make your submission, even if this happens. So, like I said before, um, presence and absence, uh, average tree size, and then uh, canopy cover just to gauge stand health. And I'm just going to go into more detail about the tree size and canopy cover because uh, there are multiple options for those ones. So um, the categories that we want you to pick from for tree size are mostly large, mostly medium, mostly small or mixed. This is kind of our like key for that. So if it's mostly large trees, if you go and try to give one of those trees a hug, you're not gonna be able to wrap your arms all the way around it. Um, if it's mostly medium, you can get your hands to touch. And then if it's mostly small, uh, you can just put your hands around it, no arms necessary. Um, so just whatever most of the trees in the area look like. Um, and if there's not really like a clear dominant size class, um, then just say that it's mixed. So this one's pretty straightforward. And then um, stand health is a little bit more complicated, but just kind of eyeball it. Um, so looking at like for all of the trees, all of the hemlocks that you see in the area, um, looking at in terms of like needle loss and kind of like green versus brown on the on the tree. If it's um, a healthy tree, you know, it, it'll have no or like maybe less than 20% needle loss. Mild loss, which is like 20 to 40%. Moderate, which is 40 to 60. Uh, significant, which is 60 to 80. And then drastic, which is 
um, like more than 80% of needle loss and the tree is like very clearly on its way out the door. Um, and so this is kind of what that looks like. Some of these pictures aren't super clear, um, but you know, a, a nice healthy hemlock will have um, all or most of its needles. It'll be very green, very full, um, cast that really dense shade that I mentioned before. Um, mild loss uh, with HWA, the um, infestation will start at the bottom and move towards the top. So the trees will gradually look more and more top heavy as the inf infestation gets worse. Um, so if you see loss kind of like starting at the bottom um, with like drooping needles or needles that have fallen off, um, if it's just a little 20 to 40%, um, moderate, so like kind of half the tree looks like it's not doing so great, uh, significant loss where it's like most of the tree, um, and then drastic here, this, this tree very clearly is dead if not, um, or dying if it's not already dead. So still pretty straightforward, a little bit more difficult than um, just tree size, but um, give us just your best guess. Don't spend too much time like worrying about being completely right. Um, but so just those two criteria and then a nice good like picture of the needles that you're looking at and um, whether or not you saw HWA. And that's it. That's all we need you to submit. And you can submit as much as you would like. And then we will use this data to see how it is distributed in the Finger Lakes region based on what our volunteers have collected and uh, decide how to proceed from there and get in contact with the, uh, the right people who will be able to do um, like the right thing about it. So that's everything that I have. If there are any other questions, and I can go back to that QR code if people need it. Oops, there we go. There's the QR code again in case anybody didn't um, grab it before. Do you have a, a map of like the state to show where the worst infestations are? Um, from our data, not yet, because we have not finished collection, collecting for the season, but, um, I do have, I can back up to, um, the map of the East coast. Um, so in, <coughs> in our region, um, it, there's a lot of it in Monroe County. Uh, if you've ever been to Gosnell Big Woods in Webster, I don't know if anyone's from Rochester, but uh, that area has a lot of HWA, unfortunately. Can you, can you zoom in on that at all? It's real hard to see. Um, yeah, I think I can. Sorry, that's I think not... we've lost the screen share. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'll fix that. Sorry, that's not a ton better. Um, we'll we'll share our like map of volunteer data once everything's been submitted for the season. So basically, south of us is where it's worse. Yeah, um, it's definitely. Um, because it's been like moving upward from Virginia, it's definitely worse like in the southern tier um, than it is up here. Madison County, though, in particular, seems to have an absence of it, um, or at least like very, very little <laughs> to the point that we have not received any reports of HWA in Madison County, like so far in the program, both this year and like in previous years. Um, but yeah, it is very, very well established in Monroe County. I found some on a hike in the, along the Crescent Trail, uh, like behind my neighborhood a couple months ago. Um, but it is in, it is distributed throughout like the entire region at this point, Ex with the exception, hopefully of Madison County. <laughs>
I'm gonna put that QR code back up really quick, just in case anyone didn't get it before. Um, are there any, <coughs> sorry, my voice is going. Are there any other um, questions for anything that I've talked about? Great. Well, in that case, um, I'll put my email up. So if anyone has any questions, um, just let me know if you think of something later or when you're using the app, you just need um, like some sort of assistance or just think of a question. Um, but thank you all very much to, for listening to me talk about it. Uh, I'm very passionate about this program and about trying to stop HWA in the area. So I appreciate you all coming to listen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank this you. This is a, a really good uh, presentation. It's definitely something that's super important. Um, so before everybody hops off, I wanted to just let you all know that this is recorded. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, just look up uh, Finger Lakes Trail Conference. And we have uh, all the other ones that we've had for the FLT Connect presentations. So this one will be added to that tomorrow. Um, and Please um, look into more with the Finger Lakes Trail. We're having a lot of our events coming up. We have our county series, our county hikes that are starting, so you can register for that. We're also going to have our Hike 101s if you are a beginner hiker and you want to get out there more. And we uh, definitely encourage people to become members. That's how we are able to function. And um, you can be part of the events committee to put things like this together. So there's a lot of great things that we do. So definitely check us out, um, fingerlakestrail.org, if you haven't already. All right. And thank you, everybody, for attending. And thank you, Camille. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, thank I saw you. a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, a lot of things. Oh, yeah, Durand Eastman Park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'll stick around until.